Welcome to Bleeding Code, I'm John Jardine and in today's video I'm going to show you how to test the baseline performance of your Node application. From the context of an API server, we're going to be using a performance testing tool to consume an endpoint that we'll create to determine the requests per second that our application can handle. I'll be going over a little bit of theory around baseline performance as well as going into some live demonstrations and I'm also going to provide some important tips when it comes to considering a production environment. There's going to be a couple of gotchas we need to be aware of as well as some tips and tricks so be sure to stay watching till the end. Finally, for those who don't actually work with Node.js, many are, much of the theory and practices that I'll be explaining in this video are platform agnostic so there's something for everyone. Let's get started. Right, as I said before, this is Bleeding Code, your one stop for all things related to the Moon stack, that's Node, React, Mongo, integration and supporting technologies. Right now I'm busy on a series called Node.js Performance Optimizations. This is the third video installment of that series. If these topics interest you, be sure to subscribe to my channel, click on the subscribe button as I release content almost every week. So when it comes to a typical Node application, the common means of communication happens via some sort of HTTP endpoint. These are web APIs that we expose to third parties. And we usually make use of an HTTP server and in the, for the demonstrations of today we're going to use Express. Now by the time we're done with our business logic and, and we are in a position where someone can consume our API so that we can trigger our business logic, we ultimately want to start understanding how fast uh, can our HTTP request run? In other words, how many requests can we even handle on a per second basis? Because when you hear online that uh, Node.js is very powerful with the event loop, you can process 50,000 requests per second at every given time, that's all good and well, but there are many factors that come into play before uh, taking a, a, a number like that to heart. For example, what are the specs of the machine that the node uh, application is running on? Are you running a single process on a single thread with one event loop or are you clustering it? Uh, what, are, what middleware are you running for your HTTP server? What kind of security and authentication is involved? What business logic do you have and how much um, blocking code are you running inside that JavaScript logic? Are you connecting to third party environments? Uh, that and how long do they take for example to get data in and out so there are many factors that come into play when you want to start understanding why is my application slow or why does it take so long for my API to run but what's very important is that we understand at the at the bare metal minimum how fast can we actually process a transaction how many requests per second can we actually handle at a bare metal minimum all right, so that's our first demonstration. I'm going to show you in Node using Express how we can set up a bare minimum baseline application with a very, very quick API endpoint that we will expose and we're going to use a performance benchmarking tool to throw a number of requests its way to understand how fast the, our application can run and how many requests per second it can handle. So let's go. So before we get to our node application, the benchmarking tool that I'm going to be using today is called AutoCannon. Uh, it's written completely in Node. It's by the same team that br brings us uh, Fastify and Pino Logging. I have a tendency to lean towards their tools because they're all about speed and performance and optimization. So I'm going to be using AutoCannon, but obviously you can make use of other benchmarking tools such as uh, Apache Benchmark, Work, uh, Artillery or anything else that uh, you might be using on your site. But yes, I'm gonna be running AutoCannon today. And if you wanna do the same, all you do is you install this on your machine globally because you'll ultimately use it not only for a specific project, for any kind of project. So you wanna install it uh, globally. So I've got a little Node app over here. It's very basic. There's uh, nothing crazy happening behind the scenes. I've got a .env file that I'm gonna be referencing. So you'll notice that I am setting the Node env to production. I think it's quite important if you're performing baseline uh, testing you don't want express uh, set to development or anything like that so we want to make sure that the environment is set to production and I'm going to be exposing our endpoints at port 6000 so for our first test we're going to go with a bare metal express setup so you can see I'm just requiring uh, the .env configuration over here so that our variables will load I am requiring express app and HTTP so you'll have to install the module express if you're following along but the rest comes with Node natively. 
He has my router set up. So here's where I'm exposing a very simple GET request. It's on the root. And all it's doing is it's sending an empty stream back as a response. So I mean, this is as small as what I can think of uh, when, when creating an endpoint API. There's almost nothing happening over here. So it should be almost immediately. Um, I'm exposed the port, create the server, and run it to listen on port 6000. And that's it. That's our basic setup over here. So at the bottom, I've got two terminal windows. The first one is to run my node application, and the second one is to run the autocannon test. So what I'm going to do over here is I'm going to say node 1, and we can see that our node application is running, listening on port 6000. So on the right-hand side, the command for autocannon, it's actually quite easy if you follow their defaults. What we're going to do for this demonstration is I'm only going to run it for 10 seconds using 10 concurrent uh, users and one pipeline. And to do that, I just have to type autocannon and reference the URL. And that's it. I'm referencing the root URL. Let's give us more space over there. And that's enough for us. It, it's going to run. Uh, it's going to run for 10 seconds. It's going to run 10 concurrent users uh, under one pipeline. You obviously have the flexibility to configure Autocannon exactly to what you want. And in fact, in the real world, I usually run. I run it for about 30 seconds, maybe for 10 pipelines. I do change the configurations. But for the purpose of this demonstration, you'll get my point. Just running the default setup. So let's go ahead and run this. Now, while we're waiting for it to run, there is one thing I'm going to mention as well, and that is you want to run this two more times. You want to run it at least three times. It takes about once or twice to warm up, and I'll explain why, sh I'll explain why shortly. I'm running it now for the second time, and I'm probably going to pause the video quickly until the third time has been completed. All right, so welcome back. So we've run this now three times, and we'll have three data sets that we can start referencing over here. There's obviously a number of metrics that you can take into consideration, but for and, and the autocannon documentation and any sort of benchmark testing documentation will provide detailed information on how to read this inform, uh, read these metrics that are displayed to us. But really, for the purposes of uh, our baseline testing, what we really want to know is what is the average request per second that uh, this benchmark tool was able to throw uh, throw at us and get successfully processed. So. If we take the three uh, results, the three tests that we ran over here, and again, I ran three tests because usually it takes once or twice to warm up, and I only stop running tests when I see that the averages are less of very like a percent difference from each other. Then I'm like, okay, fine, we we more or less in the same region. There will always be a difference. It will never be exact. That's just some. That's just a reality that we'll have to accept. So for our first test, we can see over here that uh, we were able to run about just under 17,000 requests per second. If we go over here, that dropped down to 16,000 requests per second. And if we jump, and if we look over here again, 16,300. So there's like a 300 difference, and that's usually why I run it about two or three times. So I'll take this one over here, 16,320 requests per second. Obviously, it's usually a lot higher on my Mac, but keep in mind that I'm recording and I'm, I've got VS open and all that kind of stuff. So this number, use, it's usually about 21,000. And this brings me to an important point uh, before we move forward. And that is when you want to run this uh, performance uh, testing, what you want to do is you want to make sure that the state of your machine is consistent across all your tests. And what I usually do is I set up a checklist for myself to say, okay, before I start testing, make sure that my machine is in this state. So items on my checklist would be number one, restart my machine. Number two, after give it about two minutes to initialize, uh, obviously after restarting. But number two, then go and close any applications that are not needed that could unnecessarily grab CPU and memory. So for example, I'm running, I usually run Docker server and I've got OneDrive and Dropbox that load on startup. I will go and close those for the sake of possibly getting a couple of hundred extra requests per second uh, when, when I run my benchmarks. But what's more important is that once I've done all of that, I make I ensure that this is the state of my application. This is the state of my machine when I start that performance testing. I will usually then I won't even open VS Code like I have now. I'll usually open up uh, two terminals or two command prompts. The one is to run my Node application, and the other one is to perform the performance benchmark uh, testing. 
As a side, depending on the complexity of the commands, I might open up like a notepad or something very light where I can copy and paste the commands into the command prompt or terminal because uh, you might end up wasting time and making mistakes having to type a lot of these configurations out manually. But that I would have open at the bare minimum and that I will ensure will be the state every time I test my applications. So coming back to our application over here, we can see, okay, we're accepting the fact that around 16,320, this is the average request per second that our application and machine are able to, uh, to, 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 to handle on our local machine. So obviously keep in mind that we're only using one thread, one process, one event loop in this case. There are ways to bring this value up a lot higher and uh, we, could, we could even use alternative HTTP servers like Fastify or, or, or Happy or something uh, along those lines. But in the case of this video, we're just going to stick with what we have now. So coming back to our application, we now see that we will accept that an average of 16,320 requests per second is what our machine can, and application can produce when the performance benchmark tool is running. But before we go and scream to the heavens that this is how fast our application can run, let's obviously understand that number one, there's no business logic. It's, it's a very, very simple GET request right now, number one. Number two, there's no middleware. There's no security, there's no compression or logging or anything of the like that's running in between, uh, between this request and our application loading, um, which is a very, very terrible practice. So what we need to understand here is not only what our baseline benchmark is, but we need to understand, understand what is our minimum production benchmark. In other words, what must our application have by default and then measure that benchmark, uh, benchmark that performance as well. So let me give you an example of what I mean by this. I'm going to clear these values and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go, go to our next test where we are going to introduce uh, an express middleware called Helmet. Now it goes without saying no, no node application that uses Express or any other HTTP server should be deployed without running Helmet as the middleware. It just it introduces all the necessary security requirements. It implements all the security features that you should have by default in your Node application. So this is what I mean by minimum production requirement. You have to have something like Helmet. You have to have logging. You have to have uh, other tools running in the middleware. And that will greatly affect the amount of requests per second that you can run once that middleware is in place. So in this case, all we're doing over here is we've got Helmet. We are using it as the middleware. Everything else has remained the same. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to load the second file and I'm going to rerun our auto cannon test. So welcome back everyone. Uh, I ran the three tests for using Helmet and we can see the first one that came back was 12,600 requests per second. Now that's already a drop from 16,320. Do you see what a difference the middleware can make? But let's go and see our second test. That dropped to 12,008. Okay, that's a 600 difference. And 12,274. Okay, that's like a 200 difference. So let's grab this 12,274, round it up to 12,300 versus 16,300. There's a 4,000 requests per second difference just by introducing Helmet. Okay, it's quite sad, but you, they, there's always a balancing act when it comes to the required middleware in order to ensure that your application uh, conforms to the, the, the best practices when it comes to security, compression, and the like. So there's and security first. Your application has to have the required security implementation. You can't just expose it and, and have it uh, running so vulnerable uh, for the sake of being able to process additional requests per second. So please just keep that in mind. As the final test, and just something that I, when it comes to logging, there, there are many logging middlewares that you can use in your environment. Some of them are seriously powerful, like Pinot, uh, Express uh, Logger, um, and, and Winston, and a couple of others out there. But many, many applications uh, you land up just using Morgan. It's usually the, the sort of standard, unless you then move off to something a little bit more uh, performant or, or the like. So what I'm going to do for my next demonstration is I'm going to introduce Morgan, which you'll have to install. And you can see over here, I use Morgan with a default setting of combined. So that's going to provide us with our logging when these requests are being performed. But let's go and see what happens now when we've got something like Morgan Logger uh, running behind the scenes. And welcome back. All right, so we've got three tests uh, for Morgan. 
And the last that we left off was 12,000, uh, it was, what was it, 12,300, I think, if that was, if I'm not mistaken. And, but we can see now with Morgan, that dropped all the way down to 5,400. And here's 4,600. And where's our last one? 5,600. So even if we take this one, 5,600, that's a massive drop from what was originally 16,300 all the way down to, I think, what was it, 12,300? So now we're down to 5,700. That's a terrible drop in the requests per second uh, just to introduce something along the lines of logging, all right? But it, 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 it might be a requirement. You have to define your practices in your environment. You might use third-party logging tools. That's great. But in the case of what we're doing over here, printing to the console, it is a serious drop in the amount of requests that we can run. I'd like to introduce a nice little tip over here if you do, if you are using Morgan, and it's something that we also used at a time when we were using Morgan, is that we would go and say that skip any, skip the, 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 the logging of anything that falls under a status code of 400. In other words, only log exceptions and errors. And if we had to, if we go and replace the normal Morgan combined with this instead, and we, I'm just going to go and run one test for this example. Look at that jump all the way down to almost 12,000 requests again. And the reason for that is because it won't print out anything that's relatively successful. And that gives us a massive boost in the amount of requests per second again. So that's just a tip for anyone using Morgan. Go ahead and use that uh, instead of just having Morgan print out everything by default. So that brings us to the end of our demonstration. And I just want to close off with a thought. We've obviously been discussing about how we need to not only determine the baseline performance, but also understand the produ minimum production requirements and the measurement over there. You also got to, once you've got the middleware and the security measures out of place, you also got to start understanding what is your authentication layer, what is your strategy over there, because that's going to be involved on almost any API that you are going to exposed, uh, expose from your application. And that also needs to be taken into consideration before you have some sort of minimum production metric or measurement uh, to, to understand how fast your application runs. Only once you've got all of those things in place can you now start saying, all right, if after a production require, minimum production requirement, I'm, pros, I'm handling 12,000 requests per second, and now I go and add in some business logic, which brings that all the way down to two seconds uh, per request, you have a very small window now to understand what is causing the problem, what are the bottlenecks, are they third parties, or what is happening over there. And, you know, this takes me to, uh, there are other things that you can maybe consider, which is managing the event loop process and uh, trying to test and see what maybe third party modules are causing conflicts. The good news is I actually have a couple of other videos as part of my Node.js performance optimization series that could probably help you when it comes to this kind of stuff. So um, there will be links to this at the end of the video as well as in the description. And uh, if you like this kind of content and if you enjoyed today's video, give me a thumbs up by clicking on the like button. Be sure to subscribe to my channel. I'm releasing videos almost every week. And uh, also, there is an online source code repo called Node.js Performance Optimizations that I have on GitHub. I will provide links to that as well. It's currently holding the source code for today's demonstration as well as the other two videos that I've created. And it's the one sort of source code for all uh, Node.js Performance Optimization videos to come. So I really hope once again you've enjoyed this video. Until next time, cheers.